Hello, I'm Menno Knetsch. I am Program Director of the Master Biobased Materials. And today I want to tell you my vision on what the new materials for the future should be. This presentation is entitled New Materials, What Do We Actually Need? Green, Biobased or Biodegradable? First of all, I want to go through some of the frequently used terms in combination with new materials. You often hear people uh, referring to green materials. Green materials are materials that are made according to the philosophy of green chemistry. And that's in the bottom line is that we want to have zero waste and zero pollution at the end of the production, but also that the products at the end don't contribute to new pollution. The second term you often hear, and which is frequently used in the newspapers, is the term bio-based. The term bio-based means that the materials are made from a biological feedstock. So that means that in contradiction or in comparison to fossil-based materials, these are made from renewable feedstocks which grow outside. So it could be a, a tree, a plant, an agricultural feedstock or something like that. The third term you often hear, and you often hear that in, uh, in the context of pollution of the plastic soup in the oceans, is biodegradable. And biodegradable has to do with the end of the plastic. So where do they end up? And biodegradable means that in a natural or an industrial environment, these materials will decompose to its original constituents. So they will completely disappear and you could, in principle, via plants, make new materials out of it. In the rest of the presentation, I will uh, go into details on these terms and what we envisage should happen for the future. First of all, there's often a confusion between the terms bio-based and biodegradable. That something is bio-based, so made from plants, doesn't mean it's biodegradable. Yeah? Bio-based says something about where the plastics come from, so how they are made. What materials do we use to make these materials? Biodegradable has something to say about the end of its life. Yeah? So where do they end up? What happens to these materials once they end up in our environment? Uh, you all know that you can go to the beach and pick up plastic bottles. These are typically not biodegradable, but they could well be bio-based. So they could be made from a biological source. So the terms bio-based and biodegradable are not the same. They're totally different. Bio-based says something about where the material comes from. Biodegradable says where it ends up. Yeah, so these two terms I will explain a bit more and I will start with the term bio-based. Because bio-based materials are made from biological feedstocks. These feedstocks can be of different origin. And in this scheme you see behind me, you can see that there are in large, six large streams which can deliver the biomass, so the biological feedstock, to make materials. And you know some of them because from the forestry you know that we can make paper. Yeah, so the trees are ground up, they can make building materials out of it, so wood, but you can also from the pulp we make paper. These days the paper industry looks for new applications of their pulp, so new materials from a biological feedstock. Another one we know is, of course, agriculture. Yeah, so, for instance, from the starch, from corn, we can make perfect plastic. And also from the corn stover, so from the rest, the leaves, the hay, we can make materials. There are also some which are maybe not so obvious. For instance, domestic waste yeah, is now collected in the organic part, so what you throw in the green bin, that is made into compost. But also in the other waste, so the plastic waste, which is now often separated from the other, we can still go back to new materials. Sewage is another surprise maybe. It's always a bit smelly and people don't have a nice connection to it, but it contains a lot of organic material which can be, for instance, via fermentation, be converted into materials we can use in tomorrow's world. Finally, I want to stress the animal residues. People think of animals mostly as only food, but we are using animal materials already for centuries. Leather is the most famous example, but you could also think of chicken feathers or of the manure actually in fermentation that's now used not maybe for materials, but for energy, so bio-based energy. If you think about all this biomass, there are plenty of, of possibilities to make new materials. 
I have three examples which you already encounter and which are used frequently. First is starch-based uh, packing peanuts. You often get a big box with a small gift and all the space is filled up with these yellow peanuts and they're made often from starch. You can also make the polyethylene, which we use for making the plastic bags, from sugarcane. There's a big company in Brazil that already does this, Braskem. They, make, uh, they take sugarcane fermented to alcohol. The alcohol is then converted to ethylene and that's polymerized to make polyethylene. That's the same plastic you can make from oil. It's identical. So also its fate later in the environment is identical. It's not degradable, makes exactly the same uh, applications. And finally, that's a famous one also for the Netherlands, it's polylactic acid. Lactic acid is the stuff that bacteria make to make yogurt taste sour, but you can also use it to make materials. And especially there's some companies for, uh, associated to the sugar production in Holland, which are very good at making polymers out of that. And these are often used in biomedical applications. So high value, very precise and highly specialized applications that are for instance used in orthopedic screws. The advantage is that these materials can degrade in the body, so you don't have to re-operate to get the material out. You only have to put it in, and you can leave it there and it will slowly degrade. So these materials are not only bio-based, but also biodegradable. Why are we interested in bio-based materials? So what's the reason why we actually care? Well, first of all, there is a depletion of fossil reserves. So that's oil, gas and coal. Yeah, and it's going to run out at one point in time, and it's our duty as a university to be ahead of the problems that will occur in a couple of decades. Second, there is the problem of global warming. And global warming has to do with freeing carbon dioxide from the fossil reserves, and that heats up the planet. If we can use a sustainable source, so a local plant for making the same materials, we use less fossil fuels and we get less CO2 uh, released in the atmosphere. And finally, fossil fuels are very uh, weirdly distributed over the world. So there are specific places where we get oil from. And you can imagine that if we convert or revert to a bio-based society, that you get redevelopment of rural areas where agriculture now becomes not only a food producing, but also a material producing countryside. This is not set yet. I mean, there's loads of political and other issues, but it's the future and it's unavoidable. This will happen in decades or maybe next century. If you think now about biodegradability, biodegradability is not the same as bio-based. Biodegradability says something about the end of plastics. And biodegradable plastics are plastics that when they end up in the environment, there are decomposed into smaller non-toxic parts and especially microorganisms play an important role in that. And they do that because they use the plastics as food. And in the picture you see bacteria eating on a pet bottle, so on a regular uh, fizzy drink bottle. And it will take them a couple of years, but eventually they will clear away the whole bottle. Well, if you think about pollution, that would be a good option. If you think about use, it's something you don't want. You don't want your bottle to already be attacked by bacteria when it still has to function as something which holds your fizzy drink. So you need a bit of control. The degradability as we use it today, there are two main parts. One is composting, and we all know composting from your trial at home. The smelly bin from the neighbor which you like in winter but you don't like in summer. And the other is environmental biodegradation, so degradation which spontaneously happens if plastic is left in the environment. Composting is a process which is in industrial form highly controlled. So what happens is they collect the organic matter from domestic waste, they sort of mix it up and the organic matter is then converted into its original parts and that's in this case CO2 carbon dioxide, water, and the minerals, so the phosphates and the nitrates, etc., a little bit of biomass and humus, and that's the stuff you buy as compost at the garden center. Uh, the CO2 that's released here is later then reused by the plants to make new material, so it's not contributing then to the global warming. 
And if you now look at composting, for instance, at home, so the, the bin you have in the back of your garden, and industrial, there's a difference because in industrial setting, we, they control the temperature, they control the aeration, so they mix it up once in a while, they turn it over, and the speed at which the material has to degrade is limited. So everything you can throw in the bin has to be composted within six months. It depends a bit on the country how long that period is, but approximately half a year. If you compare that with degradation in the environment, you have no control over temperature, no control over how uh, wet it is or how much oxygen comes by. So industrial setting composting at this moment is the most logical way of degradation. However, we would like also plastics to eventually degrade in the environment because if we lose them, if they fall off our radar, we still don't want them to persist in the environment. If you think about biodegradation, one of the products that appears is CO2. And the CO2 that is produced by the degradation of the materials in the soil is reused by the plants in the photosynthesis to make the sugars, to make the starches from which we can make materials again. If you compare that with the use of fossil fuels, this is new CO2, CO2 which was fixed millions of years ago, and that's then used to put back into the environment. One of the arguments against biodegradation is that once you put the plastics in a landfill, the CO2 is stuck there, so it doesn't contribute to global warming. My answer to that would be, how long can you put stuff under the ground? That you run out of place at one point in time, and it's gonna bite you in the tail eventually, because it leaks toxic chemicals, and at the end, you're lost for space. So we do have to do something now, and to make our materials biodegradable is one solution. I will tell you, give you two examples in which biodegradation can be helpful, but it depends on the need of the user. What do you actually want? What do we as society want? And the example is agricultural use of plastic, the use of mulch. Mulch plastic uh, prevents the growth of unwanted plants next to the cultivated plants. Because you cover the soil with plastic, you put a hole in it, put your plant in, and the rest doesn't get light. Also, the temperature is raised a bit and there is a better regulation of the moisture. The problem, however, is that this plastic persists and you have to take it off the land at the end of use. And farmers don't like that very much because that's extra work, this plastic is broken and it takes a lot of time. So, what are the properties you would need for a perfect mulch plastic? It would have to be as strong as it is now, as cheap as it is now, but it should degrade after my plant has been harvested. And the thing we should strive for is a plastic that you could induce to degrade. So when you no longer need it, you do something to it and it starts degrading. Another example is disposable diapers. We have a mountain of about 27 billion diapers per year. The number changes per publication, but it's a lot of diapers. That's a big mountain. Most of them are put in landfill. 90% are disposed of in landfill. It would be good if those ones would degrade over time. The materials you use are quite diverse, so there's different layers of different materials. So it will take quite a lot of time before you can completely uh, revert or convert to biodegradable disposable diapers. But if you see here in the small diagram, there's at least six types of materials, and these materials have to all be converted to a material which can be degrading. So it's not an easy task. We do not want, when our babies sit on the couch, that the water drips through and you have a wet couch. You do not want the smell. So all these functionalities have to be also represented in the new biodegradable variant. I feel we can do that, but there has to be the wish to actually invest in that. And if you think about this huge mountain of diapers, then you can imagine that biodegradation, even if it takes a couple of years, can help preventing the accumulation of large amounts of waste under our soil, under our feet. Now we come to a couple of statements. What is actually the essence of our problem? 
The essence of plastics is that we have over-designed them. We have made them so good that we at the end don't know if we can get rid of them. Yeah, so we have not thought about what to do with them when we no longer need them. And it's not only plastics, we have done it with a lot of products, but plastics is now, I think, one of the biggest problems. They are ways too stable, so we don't know how long it takes. Some of these plastics uh, persist for centuries, yeah? and they may be fragmenting into small parts, but they're still there. So the microplastic problem, so these small parts, have now become such a problem that even they end up in our food. So if we buy a fish, there are small particles of plastic in there. And recently, even the last deep sea ecosystem, which we thought was devoid of plastic, has been shown to also have plastic in the animals. It is a big problem. So another thing which associated to that is that we got addicted to plastics and its properties. The plastic properties we have and we use it every day, we do not want a material that's less good. Yeah, but eventually we have to think different and accept that what's good enough will also do. We don't need a plastic bottle that persists for 500 years. Once it's used, it should be gone after two years. So the bottom line is that at this moment, the plastics are governing us. We're only responding. We're picking the pieces up. We're not in charge anymore. A famous example is the cleaning up of beaches. And my idea of beach recreation is different than picking up junk. So I feel we should do something about it now. And your question, of course, is what should we do? Well, what we should do now is design new plastics. And from the start of the design, think about end of use. So what are we going to do at the end with these plastics? We realize that they need the properties we are used to, but we have to get to grips with the idea that plastics are good enough and not fantastically over brilliant. We should work on achieving this in a large multidisciplinary group and we should design them so that we are now in charge. We decide what is the fate of a plastic, we decide where they end up and we decide what the properties are. So I put it as we should be governing the plastics, we should prevent and not solely act. Yeah? So what should we do and what do we need to achieve these goals? We need, of course, a completely different thinking in the producers of the plastics, but also in the users. And disposer, yeah, disposing of the plastics is an important fact of it. So the more we reuse and recycle, the better it is. We cannot avoid losing some plastics in the environment. They should be biodegradable. We should, and this is a, maybe a typical Dutch thing, but I think we can do that Europe-wide or worldwide. We should work on this in a multidisciplinary workforce and we should create a sort of a delta plan plastics control. Everyone finds this problem the biggest problem in the world, but this is one that we all notice and we all have in our daily lives. It may take decades, so it may take 30, 40 years. But the problem is we should have started doing this way before. We are waiting too long. We are, we are not doing anything about it. I mean, the rule is that we're not to blame for the world as it is, but we're to blame when it stays the way it is. That's more real than ever. So with this, I want to conclude my presentation. I hope that I made clear to you that biodegradation can be a solution for some of the plastic problems. It's not the only one. Reuse and recycling is which you will hear in the other talks, are other options. But I feel in the design of new materials, in the design of new plastics, we should take into account what we want to do with them after we've used them. So I thank you. My contact information is here. Uh, you can find it on our website. And I hope that you have sort of, that you can share my concern concerning the plastic pollution we are living in today. Thank you for your attention.